I love that song. I don't know about you, but man, Oh How He Loves is one of my favorite songs. It's because it just reminds me that the God of the universe, who knows everything about me, still loves me. And the truth is, there are moments where I don't even love me. And yet, he looks at me and he says, I love you, with a perfect love. And then, it doesn't just stop there. He invites us. He invites us to be a part of what he is doing. And we're going to see that even in the Sermon on the Mount today. As, as we talk about that in Matthew chapter 5, it's this beautiful time where he sits the disciples down. And he says, I'm inviting you into a journey that is going to change the world. And I'm going to use you and all your faults and failures, all your brokenness, I'm going to use you to carry that mission forward. And so any time that we come into God's presence and we feel like we've got to have it all together or I'm, you know, I've got to be perfect for God to use me, listen, he, he seeks us in our brokenness with our faults and our failures, and it's not about us, it's about him redeeming us. It's about him taking all of those things and bringing healing and allowing us to be used the way we are. And it's just, it's beautiful to me. Um, we're going to continue our series. Uh, the, the series is called Distinct. And it's a series on the Sermon on the Mount. And it's uh, Matthew 5 to 7. And the unique thing about this is I can just imagine, right, that Jesus is sitting there on the hillside and he's teaching the disciples. In the beginning of this teaching, he shares these incredibly powerful but short statements. And I know for my kids, um, you know, oftentimes they'll say, well, I'll try to share something that's really vital, I think, life-changing for them, because I'm dad, and I'm going to share this. And so about a half hour later, they're, they're saying, okay, yeah, whatever. Dad, could you say that in a shorter, you know, phrase or, you know, sum it up? And the truth is, Jesus in this moment says some of the most powerful things in some of the shortest ways. And he captures the heart of what, the essence of what he wants us to understand and know. And so today, as, as we begin, he's going to be talking about mercy and how mercy is one of those points of distinction that we as followers of Jesus should be evidencing. And, you know, mercy for many oftentimes is thought of in this uh, one realm, more of a negative realm. Let me give you an example. So there have been a few moments in my life where I've been pulled over by the police for speeding. And I, surprise, surprise, <laughs> uh, it's happened. And, um, you know, I admittedly have a lead foot and is... As I get pulled over, it's the worst feeling in the world, isn't it? Can we just admit it? It's terrible. And then, uh, you know, you're over on the side of the road, and if you've been in that situation, you know the drill. You know what happens. They walk up beside, roll your window down, license and registration. You hand it to them. They go back to their car, and it seems like, I wonder what they're doing. Background checks, checking my Facebook account. I don't know what they're doing, but it seems like it takes an eternity. And then they walk back up and you're like, oh man, I got to explain this to my wife. <laughs> you know, and I, you know, all, all of this reality of my insurance is going to go up. And he says, hey, I looked at your record. And... I'm going to let you off today with a warning. You need to slow down. Now listen, in that moment, I deserved the ticket. I earned it. <laughs> and yet in that moment, although I deserved the ticket, he extended mercy. And he didn't give me what I deserved. And so we understand oftentimes that's our view of mercy, and it's a correct view of mercy, is that 
God doesn't give us what we deserve, but he extends mercy to us. As we look at the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, he talks about mercy, but it's in a little different sense. And so I want to take you there, and I want to start unpacking what this looks like so we can understand the multiple ways where mercy can be expressed and understood. So if you would, take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5, and in verse 7, again, a very short but powerful way that Jesus speaks to the disciples. He says this, blessed or spiritually prosperous are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. See, it's mercy in this passage is not looked at in the negative sense that I'm not getting what I deserve, but Jesus is speaking in, into another sense, and that is the ability to care for those who are hurting around me and act on their behalf. I've actually uh, written down, kind of summed up my thoughts on what this looks like if we had to define it this way, and it would be this. It's an awareness of those who are hurting around us, producing actions focused on relieving their hurt, suffering, or need. So it's not just an awareness, but it's an awareness that produces mercy produces something, actions focus on relieving their hurt or need. Now, the truth is we're surrounded by a world, it seems like, that has their hand out and is kind of leveraging mercy, if I might say. Let me give you an example. I was in the uh, pet store the other day, and I was buying dog food. And um, on my way out, I'm, I'm paying, and as I'm paying, and the little thing that you put your card into, on the screen comes up this question before I could actually, um, you know, process my card. And it says, would you like to save an animal? <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> what kind of question is that? <laughs> you know, I mean, so if you choose no, you're a loser, right? I mean, they, they position it like to leverage this, this act of mercy. I've hit no every time. Um, I'm a real big loser when it comes to that. But I, I feel like that they've used that. You go through all kinds of, whether it's the mini mart, the drive through do you want to round your change up for these children who are hurting? Do you want to, you know, give to this? We'll put a balloon on the wall. We'll, and so all of this happens, and then you're driving to the mall, and you see the homeless person holding a sign say, I will work for food. My first thought, and I am just going to be raw before you, is really? Really? You're going to work for food? Because I'm already passing or casting judgment upon them because I know there have been times where that's not true, so I canvass that over everyone. And I really think that oftentimes mercy is hard to display because we become desensitized by all the people saying this is a need, that's a need, here's a need. That, and so all of these needs exist, and after a while it's just, you know, I don't hear it anymore. I don't see it anymore. I don't see the homeless person with a sign as a person made in the image of God that might truly be hurting. I see somebody using the system that won't work. So God needs to do work inside my life to bring back this sense of godly mercy. But does this mean, is godly mercy then something that necessitates, now that I've said that, that every time you see a need that you have to give to that? Every homeless person, you're, you're putting something in you know, their hand? No, I don't think so. It's the fact that God begins to stir in you an awareness of true needs around you 
with the conviction and the wisdom and the discernment to know when to act and how to act. But it's when we become desensitized that I don't see or think with the mind of God anymore toward the needs that exist around me. So I want, I want to take you to a story. It's a story that Jesus spoke, and it's a story about mercy. And I think it sheds so much light on this passage. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I want to take you to Luke chapter 10. And in Luke chapter 10, Jesus is speaking to this lawyer and the disciples are there. And he takes this opportunity to tell a story. And the incredible thing is he gets to choose the cast of the story, which is critical for us in understanding it. And so in Luke chapter 10, and we'll start in verse 30 through verse 37, and just listen to what he says here. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him and passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, listen to what he says, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal and brought him to the inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when you come back, when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The lawyer said this. He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Again, there is no mistake here in Jesus telling the story. He gets to choose the story. He gets to choose the characters. This is fictional. This is not something that is real, but he, it's there to prove a point. And so the priest was one of the holiest people in all of Israel entrusted with all the priestly duties. The Levite was also of the tribe of Levi, there to assist in all the priestly duties. So you have two very religious people. And then you have the Samaritan. And the Samaritan was of a mixed race, part Jew, part Gentile. They were despised by the Jews. And so in this instance, Jesus is using these extremes to prove a point. The first thing that we see here, the point that he is making, is that there's a difference between being religious and being a follower of Jesus. Listen, just hear me for a moment, because we can see a story and say, well, the priest, the Levite, we don't even know what Levites are anymore, you know, and the Samaritan, I don't know what that all means. But Jesus clarifies this so that we could understand this point. You can call yourself a Christian. You can have the title. You can have the position Christian and not fulfill what God called you to and test you with as a follower of Jesus. The life of distinction is not about a title. It's about an action. It's something that he is calling us to as followers. He's looking at the disciples and he said, this is what I want you to know. This is what I want you to do. This is not about a religion that's distant, but this is about an act of mercy that is distinct. You know, someone once said this, that nowhere do we imitate God more than in showing mercy. Nowhere. The second obstacle isn't just the fact that he, he was talking about it's more than just a religious figure, but there's another obstacle in showing mercy, and there's several obstacles, but he 
points out a few of them here. And one is that our preferences and our prejudices are often an obstacle. You know, we, the way we view people may determine who we extend mercy to and who we don't. I, I'm determining, I'm deciding in my spirit, you know, I don't think you deserve mercy to be given to you. But you, you, you kind of, you seem, you know, okay, I'm going to extend mercy to you. No, prejudice, and especially in this situation, the Jews were very pre- prejudicial against the Samaritans. And the Samaritans against the Jews. And here he says this beautiful picture of how the Samaritan reached into this moment and took and set all those preferences aside, set all those prejudices aside and met a need. The truth is our flesh often chooses who we want to show mercy to. But Jesus said, Don't allow your preference and prejudice to determine extending mercy. The second thing is the cost involved is an obstacle. The first cost we see was time that the Samaritan had to stop and he had to actually get involved. It was going to cost him time that day. I had a professor in college that that said, you know, um, what I want you to understand is A lot of times you get distracted by needs around you, but if like walking across campus, just grab a book and walk briskly and people think you're on a mission and nobody will bother you. I thought that's brilliant. So I put that into practice for a while and, and yet in the midst of this brilliance, it was like a total rejection of any need that might exist around me. It was my way to completely shield myself from that. So we have to understand that one of the things with showing mercy is that it will usually be inconvenient. You ever drive down the road, you see somebody, you know, alongside the road, and maybe they have a flat tire or something, and and you go, man, I hope somebody stops and helps them. (laughs) Jesus in your name. Bring somebody. Use somebody for your glory. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about? You have one of those moments because I don't have time. I'm a busy person. Got stuff, godly stuff to do. No, there's there's a sensitivity that God starts to stir in our spirit and says, I want to pour you out here. But God, it's inconvenient. Yeah, that's the point. Are you running on your time or my time? Which watch are you looking at? And so we get to this and we understand that mercy will always cost us time. It also can cost us resource. Here the Samaritan is said, gave, well, there's there's a few things, but he he gave them two denarii, which is two days wages. And in doing so, allowed him to be taken care of for at least a week but then said, if it goes above that, on my way back, I'll pay you. He was invested with his resources to meet a need that existed. And oftentimes, showing mercy will cost us something materially. The last one is involvement. And sometimes involvement here, it says that he poured oil and wine over his wounds, and he bandaged him up. He put him on his beast and and took him to the end. And I don't know about you, but, man, when when there's a situation like that, I don't know if I want to get dirty. And the reality is sometimes we're going to have to get in the trenches and get a little dirty if we're going to show mercy. I remember I was working with a, an individual in Auburn, and man, it, it, was, uh, it was tough. I'm, I'm kind of a tidy, you know, crazy, organized type person, and I like things to be clean, neat, and in their place. And I walked in this situation, and everything was the opposite. It was very dirty, unkept. And, you know, they offered me something to drink, and I was like... 
no, thanks, I'm, I'm fine. And I was thinking, that mug, I have no idea where that's been. <laughs> I am not drinking out of that. And as we began engaging in, in life, there was a need to go in and help. And in doing so, we ended up actually bagging up all kinds of garbage that was in the house and just carrying it out and trying to purge some of the things. And what we learned in this situation was it often gets dirty to extend mercy. This is not normal for me. I didn't like it, but yet God called me into this moment and says, get uncomfortable for my kingdom. Be willing to get uncomfortable. And when this Samaritan was binding up the wounds of this guy, I'm sure, who knows what he was wearing, how it impacted him, it didn't matter. He just did it. He cared about him more than he cared about his own reality of how it was going to impact him. And so he got involved. So time, resource, and involvement. So as we look at this story, there's so many truths that just pop out, but I want you to hear this, that we must understand how to cultivate mercy in our life because you can hear a sermon like this and go, I just need to be kind. I, I just need to be more compassionate. I need to look at the needs around me and be aware of them and then meet them. Listen to me. I want you to hear this, and I hope you, I hope you understand my heart in saying this. As Christians, we oftentimes try to do a lot of spiritual things in the power of the flesh. I can show mercy, but there's no spiritual aspect to it. It's, it's just, I see a need, I'm meeting it. It's my imago Dei, the, the, the fact that it's my God-likeness that naturally tends me to do that. But it, it's not spiritual, that I'm doing this in the power of my flesh. And I think we've got to turn that around. And I want to take you to a passage of scripture. This speaks to this and it's in Colossians. Colossians chapter three, and I'll start in verse five. And he says, if you're a believer, put to death, therefore, what's earthly in you. And he goes on to make a list. And then in verse 12, he says, and put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if one is complaining against the other, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so also must you forgive. As I read that passage, I am reminded of how God wants to produce something in us, but in order to do that, there must be a discipline to submit ourselves to the spirit of God within us so that we're not trying to produce heavenly fruit in the flesh. Let me say it like this. You know that you get dressed for work every day. You get dressed for the day. I'm a little nuts because I always lay my clothes out. You know, I think it takes stress off. My wife doesn't do that. But I do that. I, I, I like, I'm all ready. I'm ready to go. So physically, my day is, is set. I put on my clothes. I'm out the door. And here what he's saying is this. Get spiritually dressed. Be clothed that the Spirit of God would allow you to be clothed with mercy. So that I'm not going out trying to extend mercy in my own strength, but rather the Spirit of God is illuminating me to make me aware of needs around me, giving me discernment and wisdom of where he wants to release me. And saying, I'm going to empower you to make a difference in the lives of those around you. That's different than just human compassion and kindness. People can display that. Spiritual compassion and kindness is birthed from the Spirit of God working and stirring inside of us. 
We don't want to be a church. We don't want to be a people. We don't want to be followers of Jesus or disciples that are trying to do God's work in the power of the flesh. Getting ready for work makes sense. We need to get ready for our heavenly work. We need to be clothed in the spirit of God so that we can accomplish the works of God. If I had to say it this way, I would say this. God, today, remove my fleshly desires and allow your spirit to produce your desires. Make me aware of those in need that you want me to care for. Give me the discernment to know what that looks like. The end of the verse, he says this. Blessed are the merciful, for you will obtain mercy. Mm. This is like gold here. He says, mercy given is the path to mercy received. Mercy given is the path to mercy received. As we extend mercy, God extends mercy to us. Doesn't he say that someplace else in, in a different respect? He says, forgiven, you will be forgiven. It's not that we're working to accomplish this, but he says, as the Spirit of God releases this through you, you will experience mercy back to you. You know what? I'm not sure what I think about that. I don't know. Jesus said it. I'm okay with it. That's what he said. He, he said, listen, when you show mercy to others, God shows mercy to you. What a beautiful thing. And so, we need to also live this out. Listen, let us be people of mercy. Let us be aware of the needs that are around us and let us seek to meet those needs. If it costs us time, resource, and involvement, if I have to get uncomfortable, let me get uncomfortable for the kingdom. If it's gonna cost me something, that's okay. It's kingdom work. But let me get clothed in the power of the Spirit of God so that I'm not trying to do God's work in the power of the flesh, but that I am empowered by his spirit to accomplish his work. We need that. We need that. And so, Father, today, we as your church, we as your people, we as your followers, like those disciples, have been called to live a life of distinction. So God, help us extend mercy in such a way that people don't hear the first word being Christian. They see the first act being mercy and say there's something different with them. God, may our acts, may our actions and our words emanate things that would represent you well. And so, God, help us be aware of the needs around us and help us seek to meet those needs. Help us to be clothed in the power of your spirit so that we can extend mercy in not a physical way, but a spiritual way. And so we give you glory this morning. Release your church like you released the disciples. Release us in the power of your spirit to accomplish your kingdom work. God, help us do that well. And we give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.